This is such a good idea, by the way. This is a phenomenal idea. This is a 10 out of 10 opportunity. And uh, Dude, he pitched dude, me to why, invest. Why have I not invested in this? Like, All right, what's up? We got a banger. We got a doozy. We got a we got a two man trio here, and uh, it's just me and Sam. No guests today. Uh, Sam, what's up? Nothing. I've liked having guests. Actually, normally I hate it. Lately, I've enjoyed it. What's the difference? So we should do more. I've liked the people we've chatted with. It's been better. Yeah, not like those other crusty guests in the past. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have got. A meaty topic. It looks like I don't know if you have meaty ones, but you have four good ones, but they're smaller. Is that right? All right. I'm gonna tell you about a business that I think is kind of interesting. Ben Ben put this on my radar um, yesterday. He goes, he goes, dude, uh, your sister should open a play street, a play street. I was like, what the hell's a play street? So I look it up. Have you ever heard of this thing, play street museum? Probably not. You know, you don't have little kids, but basically, imagine like a good for you version of Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> Let's start with that as the, as the analogy. Yeah. So like Chuck E. Cheese is, you know, um, <laughs> it's like, because I have this tweet that was like, um, come eat rat pizza at my child casino. <laughs> 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 so dude, my parents used to say the, they were, I, I always thought the Chuck E. Cheese near my house had burnt down, but they just would say, no, it, it burnt down. We can't go anymore. <laughs> it, 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 I drove by there when I got a license and it wasn't burnt down. <laughs> I just thought it had burnt down. <laughs> that was their excuse. <laughs> they said it burnt down. <laughs> 16 years old, you're just slamming the drive, the driver, the, the steering wheel, just like, God damn it. It's been here the whole yeah, time. Like, it's, like, it's like one of those facts your parents tell you when you're five and you just believe it to be true. Like, totally. You know, I think I, my, I told you my, my father one time said, real men don't drink with straws, but he was referring to like a Jack and Coke. <laughs> so like for years, I was like, oh, we don't, we're not allowed to drink from Shaw's. <laughs> it's like the Chuck E. Cheese. It's the Chuck E. Cheese on Chippewa burnt down. You know, it's just not there anymore. <laughs> the Chuck E. Cheese on what? Chippewa? That was the street. Chippewa. <laughs> uh, too good. All right. So, so this thing, Play Street, is basically you go there. It's a nice, clean play. It's like the like a dream playroom for your kids. So it's like they got a giant train set. They have some learning games. They got like, you know, the floors all. It's like child safe. And you basically pay fifty beautifully you pay done. fifteen bucks, it's beautifully done, and you get to play for an hour and a half or something like that. And so Ben goes, "Yeah, I've been going to this place, and I see that basically the one near me, at least." He goes, "I think they're doing fifty grand a month." I go, fifty grand a month? That's kind of a lot." And he goes, "Yeah." He goes, "They basically they have, and I forgot the exact numbers, but it's like seven sessions a day. It's fifteen dollars each, uh, uh, and you have twenty five kids, I think, in the in the thing at once." Um, and he goes, they're basically 75% full in these sessions. You kind of do the math. You're like, all right, that gets you kind of like to 40K. Plus, you can host your kids' birthday parties there in the nights and weekends. And so some people do that. He's like, I think they're probably you know an extra 8 to 10K of, of, of sort of event revenue uh, per month. And then if you look at the cost, you know, you got your rent. It's probably like, you know, 5K. And you have to, you, know, you have your staff, your teacher, your sort of like your your supervisors or whatever that are like overseeing the the play space and like resetting it, recleaning it in between sessions. Um I think I'm pretty sure this thing is like netting uh, something like 30k a month um, in profit, maybe 25k a month in profit, and and they have tons of these locations. Yeah, so so it turns out they're franchising or something like that. I don't know if these numbers are true, by the way. This is like complete guesswork on my side, but I wouldn't be surprised. My sister owns uh, some preschools in San Francisco, and the numbers are somewhat similar. Now that's different. That's you know they pay you know a lot more, but for 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 you know regular schooling. Uh, but it's interesting to me that these play spaces can uh can do so well and it's like it's weatherproof it's like you know you just like i know with me like we go to target three times a week you might ask yourself sean what do you what do you need from target so much don't you know you can order online and what i tell you is this is uh <laughs> this is daycare for me <laughs> like i i go to sean goes to target so much that in his home <laughs> you have this like target like a, a target checkout play set and a target like grocery cart that you said you had to like find because it was like a collector's edition or like it was all sold out everywhere yeah. right did you have to like, moms go crazy for this thing, you had yeah. to like buy it on ebay and do a big markup yeah I, I, exactly these target mini grocery carts uh kids love them because they're they're used to seeing the kids like to do anything they've seen their parents doing so the whole mini grocery checkout plus 
plus target cart is, uh, is, is like in high demand. So I go there often and I do it because you got to kill time. It's like, how do I kill 90 minutes? Uh, and ideally, and I would do something that's like enriching to them. You know, worst case scenario, we just go to Starbucks or Target or whatever. And um, this would be better. I would gladly pay 15 bucks for my kids to be able to go play in a place that's not a park, which is like weather, weather dependent. So I think these are really cool ideas. Um, I, think, I think this play street thing is a, is a cool idea. And I could see this, uh, you know, this franchise doing like, you know, decently well, probably not the best franchise in the world, but I think it could do decently well. Where are the locations? <clears throat> They're like Texas. Uh, there's like none in California, none in New York. It's like a bunch of like, but what things. are they? It's like a, it's like a, what it's just a com- like blank a, commercial uh, space. Um, so like you don't need any food stuff. Uh, so you just, uh, you know, it's like a, just a blank, like retail space. Huh? Yeah. I mean, their branding is pretty, pretty good. It's like, it's kind of like how escape rooms work. Escape rooms work because right. they require no specific real estate. They can operate in a very small footprint and they take like two staff to run at any, at all, all day. And so escape rooms actually are like, you know, fairly, fairly good you know, franchise businesses, or they were for a period of time. Now, unlike an escape room, which is kind of like, you don't know if, it, if escape rooms are a fad or if they're going to be like popular three years from now. Um, these you kind of know are going to be popular because it's like, yeah, you know, every parent's got this problem. All right, let me tell you about another, another thing like this. Another problem you haven't really thought about. There's a business called 260 Sample Sale. You ever heard of this? No. Uh, let so me Google it. It's like kind of a cool New York thing. So what, what they do is any e-commerce or fashion brand has a ton of you know photo samples or product samples that they get from their manufacturer. They use them in their photo shoots um, to create the the you know pictures on the website or for advertisements or marketing or whatever. And then those don't live in the warehouse; like they live like where the photographer is or where their office is. And you just end up piling up boxes and boxes and boxes of photo samples. Um, you know, over time, because let's say you, you, you know, most fashion brands or apparel brands have, you know, thousands of SKUs for each SKU. You had a sample made before you had the production one made, but you didn't just have one sample made. You have each of the sizes made and because you needed it for the photo shoot, um, to be able to show the range or be able to cast different types of, of models. And so what ends up happening is you get a ton of these samples over, over the years that you can't really, it's like not worth your time to get rid of. Um, and so this business popped up again, like you know, the markets are like, you know, water and water is going to just float everywhere. There's an empty crevice and there's an empty crevice in this market here for getting rid of these samples. So what they do is 260 samples. So says, send us your shit brand and we will host a pop-up where we're going to sell you along with a bunch of other brands, um, all at a great markdown. So we have high quality brands at a markdown because th- these are samples. So you're not like training your customer that like, you know, hey, this is like TJ Maxx discount or something like that. It's it's a good story. This is, these are samples that you're going to get uh, for, for less. And they'll like, they'll just give the brand a commission back. They'll say, oh, you know, every time we sell something of yours, you get a small commission. And it's better than nothing. It takes it out of your space. How'd you, how'd you find this? This is totally out of your, out of your, dude, they're only based in LA, Miami, New York. And the pictures are like smoking hot women. Right. And then like, uh, it looks like a, a picture of like a huge line out of a warehouse in Soho. So hot like, women and waiting. None of those things. I don't do it. You know, yeah. your boy doesn't do it. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah. None of this checks your yeah. box. <laughs> yeah. Your boy's so married and so in the house that this is, I did not go to this. You're right. But I'm in the e-commerce world. I got my own e-commerce brand. Plus I know and talk to a lot of other e-commerce people and I know about this problem. And so I heard about this solution and I think it's very clever. Um, I think it is a smart thing to do. I also think these guys are not that well known and they're only doing it in certain um, certain areas, certain locations and, and whatever. I think this could be done at many times over. I think I think like a, a aspiring wow. hustler could do this by vertical. So you could go get a bunch of health and wellness and fitness brands or beauty brands and be like, hey, beauty brands, send us your products and we're going to we'll have a, a, a stations where you can demo them and, and sample them and then buy them. Um, so I think you could do this for other verticals. I think you could just do this in other places. Like, hey, if these guys are doing New York and LA, I think that their like, locations are like Beverly Hills and Brooklyn or something. Do this in Texas. Do this in um, do this in different different parts of the the country. I think you could have a, uh, you know, it's like your own little farmers market. It's your own flea market that you you get to to stock and run. Um, but you don't have to do it as a full time job. So you could do it with every quarter or twice a year or something like that, and still have it be successful. So I thought this was a cool. Have business. you heard? Do you know Kingsford Charcoal? 
you, you've you've seen it. It's like the most yeah, popular like charcoal, yeah. with like the blue. Do, do you know how that was created? I think it's a byproduct of something else, right? What, what was it a, exactly. a byproduct of? Wood, Ford. Oh, Ford. So Ford, uh, when 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 Ford was making cars, they had to like you know have all these furnaces making metal, and they took like the leftover char, and they're like, what should we do with this? And so they pushed it together and compact it really tight, and that's how charcoal came to be, and that's like a byproduct business, right. and I love byproduct stuff you know it's kind of like it's tangentially it's kissing cousins with like the sharing economy (laughs) i love that stuff i love byproduct stuff and this is one of those that's awesome this is actually quite cool their website is really challenging to use which is uh i think actually a good sign uh because i can't tell like apparently they do sell stuff online right uh, but it's mostly but one thing i do hate whenever i go to new york dude seeing people wait in line to buy like supreme clothing like (laughs) Just hurt your soul. put the gun in yeah. my mouth, man. Like, I'm never doing that. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to wait in line and spend my valuable time to purchase a thousand dollar like thing that should cost. The only thing know, worse than bucks. that is bottle service at a club. It's like the it, guys who are paying, you know, $7,000 for a table to and paying a thousand dollars per bottle that they could literally walk across the street buy for $40. It's, um, it's literally Dude, the chunk like, tax. It's like, oh, you're a chump. Come to this line. Please, please, please. Yeah, yeah, come right ahead. Come right ahead. You, you, you walk through the chump line. I'm not a man of God, but when Jesus made like the list of seven deadly <laughs> sins, the example of debauchery and gluttony was people waiting in line for five hours to go to a Supreme store. <laughs> I mean, like whenever like, I see that stuff, I'm like, this is the worst form of consumerism. I cannot stand this. I, so I, they have these pictures here and it turns me off. But, Amen. <laughs> I, uh, <yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I I would maybe buy this online, but I ain't standing in line. I'm not standing in line with a bunch of these people to buy this stuff. <laughs> I can't stand that. Whenever I see that, it makes me want to like throw away everything and go live in the All right, woods. Here's an idea you're going to like more. Um, host share. So got a DM from a guy named Michael Fisk, and he shows me this thing called hostshare.co. Um and he goes, here's the here's here's the, here's the situation. You have a short term rental, right? Yeah, a property. Um, yeah, shout it out so people can go stay at marathonranch.com. Uh, Marathon Ranch. Marathon Ranch. Is it dot com? Yeah, or dot co? I don't know. Yeah, dot com. Marathon Ranch. Sam com. comes by, has that. dinner with you, gives you a massage. It's fantastic. So, um, you don't have a hundred percent occupancy, right? You have some nights that are unused. Is that correct? Uh, a sixty percent occupancy rate is is a profitable month. So you got me. let's say forty percent that's unused nights. What you doing with those nights? This is the sharing economy, bro. What you doing with those Just nights? Sitting well, there. Michael Fisk has an answer for you. His answer is trade your unused nights with other hosts who have unused nights. You stay for free there; they stay for free at your place. And um, I think this is a really smart idea. I don't know how many hosts. Uh, let's Google this. How many? Hosts on Airbnb. I don't know how many properties they have or how many hosts. Four million. Okay, so you have a market of four million hosts that you could make a inter-host um, like network, basically, where you say, "Hey, if you're a host, you get to travel for free." Um, so you get to. I, now I don't know how they make things equal. So like, if your property is way more dope than somebody else's, I don't know how you make that uh, that trade uh, thing. Okay, how do you normalize the values across properties? We calculate how many shared nights you would be staying in in exchange for twenty one in exchange for the twenty one days of travel per year. The formula is established so higher higher value properties share less nights, lower value properties share more nights. So for instance, if your average night is five hundred dollars, you'll share approximately fifteen nights in a year. Whereas if you're a hundred dollars, you gotta share forty five nights in a year. Take to the same mm. minimum. That's great. So like what's your property per night per night right now? Uh seven hundred dollars. Seven hundred dollars. So you're gonna basically what they'll say is, hey. Make your thing open for 12 days out of the year. And then in exchange, you get 21 days free booking in this network. Would you take that deal? That's yeah. In fact, I do. So go to live livekindred.com. So it's kindred K-I-N-D-R-E-D and then live. Oh, live okay. Kindred. Right, this idea exists. So I use this service. So my dream situation is I want to find like another couple that has like similar style or like once as I yeah. do that lives in New York and they want to be in Austin and we could just swap. And I've not found a good solution for that. But there's this thing called li- live kindred kindred that I do that I have used where someone will stay at my home when I'm not there. And then I get credits for the marketplace. And then like, I'm going to go to Taos, New Mexico, 
like I have like eight credits because someone stayed at my house for eight nights. Right. And I know that. So I'm going to go and stay somewhere else for free. And it's actually pretty cool. I wish that it was just like a direct swap. So I could do six months here. and We could just swap for six months for six months. But I've been using services like these. I actually think that I don't think I'm not bold enough to say like, this is the future. But I think that like, you know, there are a lot of people like me who do split time. Dude, finding a place for those split, like when you split time, it's really challenging. I'm always looking for a good solution. Yeah, that's uh, that's good. I, I didn't know that something like this exists. So with this, do you... It's do hard. You, and, and I think they raised money, by the way, from Andreessen Yeah, Horowitz. you give up your space. Is that right? So you give up, you put your space in the network, but you still have to pay or you, it's free? Uh, I There's some type of service fee. Frankly, I don't think it's a good business. Uh I don't understand how they make money, <laughs> and because what what I signed what I signed up for, I was like, I'm getting a lot of value. <laughs> I'm not spending a lot of value. I don't know how you guys are doing you're, this. So like you're that's like that VC subsidy right now. You're getting that Andreessen Horowitz yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, value exchange. Yeah, so like we're trying to use our credits quickly because <laughs> I think I don't know if they're going right. to stay in business or not because I don't I don't understand how it works, but. It is awesome. If it's awesome if it does work. Uh, that's hilarious. Um, so yeah, I like these types of businesses where where uh, or that solve this problem. Uh, is host share popular? It's, I think it's it, brand I can't new. Tell. I think the guy just created it. Yeah, if you could pull it off, it's pretty amazing. It's a smart model. I think it's hard to pull off because, like, I don't understand how host share makes money. I think they have to charge a flat membership. So I think they have to basically say it's five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars a year to be in the network and. Um, you know, you only pay if you use more than five nights or something like that. Make it a, make it a fair trade, and um, you know, I think I think basically then they they're trying to get a subscription, right? So they're trying to say, can I get fifty thousand people to pay us a thousand dollars a year um, on this subscription? There's a few things like that. I forget what the big one is called, but there's they there's things like for luxury rentals where I'm almost certain that they just partnered with hotels where you pay like five grand a year. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's called Avanta. Yeah, I don't know the called? name of it, but I know what you're talking about. It's like you get access to this like network I'm, of boutique hotels. Yeah, and I've looked into them. When I originally saw it, I didn't have enough money. Like I, I wasn't in the spot that I could do it. And so I've been looking for things like this. I actually, I really like these businesses. There's one, there's this company called uh, the Nerd Wallet of England. I forget what it was called. It's called uh, Pen- Money Market Swap. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or what? There's a guy named Simon who started it. And so basically he started like the nerd wall. He started a blog that compared like mortgage rates and things like that. And then if you bought one or got a mortgage through him, you got affiliate fee. It's a, I think it's called super money market is what it's called. It's publicly traded in England. Anyway, the guy sold all of his shares after he took it public 20 years later. And he now owns this thing called like Simon's resorts. And so it's this rich guy who went and bought like 50 resort or 50, like really nice homes around the world. And I actually don't know, they, they frame it up. Like this is his personal stuff and you can just use it when he's not there. Uh, but it's actually pretty cool. And so I love these types of things because I think they're just neat to like buy all this shit and share it with everyone. I think it's really cool. Yeah. I like that. Can I tell you about a little random experiment I'm going to do? So I want to make for this Christmas season, a deep fake Santa. So basically you're going to be able to come on the site and pay $35 and you, um, and you type in your message. You could say, Hey, wish my daughter, Jessica, uh, Merry Christmas. Tell her great job with the soccer thing and, um, be nice to her brother. (laughs) Big sports fan, huh? (laughs) Great legs and soccer. (laughs) Uh, and so you'll be able to type in that message and then it'll basically create a video that Santa saying this to you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try this thing that Replit has. So Replit has this new thing where you can basically buy developer cycles. Have you seen this? No, but so you can go. So let's say you need something built. You can basically just go and buy, you can put up a bounty. So you're like, all right, I want somebody to build me this deep fake Santa. It's got to do A, B, and C. And you put up a bounty, you put up, put up the dollars, and then people will just build it for you. And, um, and you can, you basically have an award. So it's kind of like a, uh, uh, like 99, like 99 designs, designs for code. Yeah, exactly. And, and you do it in their currency, which is called cycles. And so they kind of help you estimate like roughly how many, how many cycles should this be for this to, to, to work out. Um, but I haven't used it yet. I really want to try this bounty thing. I think it's great because. So you're going to, uh, you're going to pull an Emerson. You're going to, uh, you're going to be this smart guy who just does a money grab. Uh, no, I'm going to bring, I'm going to pull a uh, Justin Mayers. I'm going to bring the joy 
of a Christmas of, of belief, really, of the belief in magic uh, <laughs> to millions of kids around the world this Christmas. What are, what are you doing for the children this year, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> is that your is, you're going to do the Justin Bears pitch? Like, so we had a problem. We wanted to bring joy to children, <laughs> but like. And we thought, what better way to do that than a fifty dollars in a world full of war uh, and divisiveness? <laughs> joy is all we have left. It is what they call the last refuge. And <laughs> people say that magic is magic, but the magic is getting people to believe the magic. And how do you get people to believe using deep fake technology? And that's what we. <laughs> yeah. how, do you, how do you get people to to believe it? <laughs> you lie. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna create a fake cartoon about a fake person. <laughs> we're gonna charge real money, and it's gonna be a fantastic result. <laughs> Are you really gonna do this? because yeah. I really want to try this uh, bounty thing. I want to play with this. Uh, I think this could be. Called. What's the URL gonna be? Um, I think it's going to be called Santa's real, uh, you know, dot org. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a dot org. <laughs> yeah. Let's make all of our businesses dot org just so we can like. <laughs> just so we can be better pretend. than other people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for a long time, I wanted to make my businesses dot net. So people would think that I've been around for a long time. But dot- <laughs> yeah, your personal website has to be a dot net. And then your business should be yeah. a dot org. <laughs> Yeah, but dot org is way better. I'm gonna do a dot org. That's way better than that stupid ass XYZ crypto <laughs> bullshit. I want a dot org. Is that what they are? Or like dot AI, dot IO. If you have a dot IO, like I'm not into it. I want a dot org. <laughs> we are a for profit dot org. It's fantastic. <laughs> is that what dot org means? It's a non profit. So. I think you have to be a nonprofit for, to get a dot org. But who makes that decision? Is there like a governing? I think body? you have to like present your EIN for your five hundred one three C or something like that. I have no idea. I've never done this to uh, be clear. I've always been firmly in the dot com camp, but I'm ready to. Uh, yeah. I made my nut and I'm ready to go and get get my dot org on for the rest uh, of my life. <laughs> 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 That's like a. Uh, on stage, Andrew, or, or backstage, we were like, so what are you doing? And he used the P word. I know. Philanthropy. He sl- slandered us with the philanthropy. <laughs> yeah. It's like, dude, if you don't say that word around me. Don't say philanthropy. Don't flex with me, bro. <laughs> and uh, so now instead of philanthropy, it's dot orgs. You know, <laughs> <Yeah. I'm... laughs> A. Wilkinson, dot org. <laughs> Go ahead and email me there. I can't find this client info. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform, so it shares its data across every application. Every team can stay aligned. No out of sync spreadsheets or dueling databases. HubSpot, grow better. Today, I want to talk about Vice. Vice Vice.com. The reason I'm talking about them is because they are about to declare bankruptcy. Right. Cue the Michael Scott clip where he just walks out and declares bankruptcy. <laughs> I always think about that. I love that clip. Now, yeah, I, I agree. Most every joke I've said on this podcast, I've stolen from that show. <laughs> um, so the reason I want to talk about them is not because of Vice, but because of the story of the founder, Shane Smith. Mm-hmm. And if you're under the age of 26, Vice probably means nothing to you. They've actually like very quickly lost relevancy. But to give you some background on what Vice is. So Vice originally was a, like a punk rock magazine based out of Montreal. So it was three Canadian guys. And one of those guys being Gavin McInnes. Do you know who Gavin McInnes is? No. Who's that? Have you, have you heard of Proud Boys? Proud Boys? Like the uh, political thing? Yeah. He started Proud Boys. Oh, okay. Which a lot of people don't realize. And so it was like these three like kind of like punk rocker guys and Gavin McInnes being one of them. Shane Smith, who I'm going to talk about today, was the other one. And basically, the way it started was they got like a grant from the government where they were able to launch this magazine. And that's how it started. It started as a a skateboarding punk rock magazine. And they would write like these amazing articles where it was like Vice's Guide to Drugs. And they would like (laughs) write all these stories about drugs. They would use the N-word all the time. They would like, they were like, wow. It's kind of like, you know how like some, you probably don't know about this, but like in the punk rock community, they like sometimes will like talk about Nazis and talk about like use racist language, but they do it as like a shock factor because it's like, I want to be in your face, that type of thing. That That's what Vice <laughs> was all about. I don't remember. I don't know if you remember like the old school covers of these magazines, but it would be like a tab of LSD on like a hot chick's uh, tongue. Do you remember it? Like, I've never those? seen the Vice magazine. I remember reading something. Actually, 
they called it just zines. Is there a difference between a zine and a magazine? Because that's what that, that's what I just just the just the just the culture. If it's someone's a zine, it's typically more it's like a punk rock thing. Okay. Whereas if it's a magazine, it could be like GQ. Okay, gotcha. So you've never seen these, but it started out as like hardcore punk rock where they would write articles about um, doing drugs, having sex, like just rock and roll shit. And that started getting picked up. And so they started this company in 94, but in 99, they moved to New York. And that was like where things changed. And that's right where like the internet just got started. What looks like you're looking at something funny. I'm looking at the magazine covers and I'm, uh, and you're saying rock and roll. And I was just thinking about like, this is what cool, like basically like this is what influential people, uh, it's like kind of like our musicians are influential people and they did this stuff. It's like the, the, the tongue with the LSD on it. It's like someone just biting a tuft of hair. I don't know what, why there's a bunch of hair in someone's mouth. And I was just thinking about pod and roll and how it would be just like someone entering a cold plunge, <laughs> someone meditating. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, we're part of that pod and roll Things movement. Have changed. Uh, yeah, we're the, we're the famous podcasters. You know what I mean? They're all just sauna cold, hot, cold, man. It's crazy. The temperature variance is insane. <laughs> Things, have Things have changed. Things have changed. Cool, Things cool have changed. has changed. <laughs> yeah, the definition of cool has changed, which is actually part of the thing I'm going to discuss. But so the internet starts coming around in the late 90s. They raise a little bit of money, like $2 million. They move down to... Um, they moved down to New York, and that's where they like really get going. And so they create the website, Vice.com. Originally, it was a magazine. It was a free magazine that they would just hand out, and they would make money off ads. And it would be the three of them writing articles. And they would do something that I used to do all the time, where they would have like fake authors. So it would be like someone who wasn't real, just fucking making up stories is really what it was, which is, you know, it was an entertainment magazine, so that's fine. But they start growing, and it takes off after a handful of years. And so... They kind of created this thing at the time. Now we just know it as like branded content, where it was now sometimes people call them advertorials, things like that. But basically, their whole shtick was we're going to make awesome content and we're going to get the eyeballs of millennials, which back then millennials were like the Gen Z today. You know, it was like the elusive, hard to reach audience. And they said, we're going to reach these millennials and we're going to make the best content. And we're just going to plaster your logo on there. And that's going to be good enough for you. And this is like pre-Facebook. So like performance advertising wasn't really much of a thing. And so it was like the way to advertise. And eventually they blow up. And the important part of the story isn't exactly that they blew up because they did. But the story is like the antics that they went along and, and, and built this thing with. And so they raised money from Rupert Murdoch, who's you know the founder of Fox. They raised money from all these amazing people, Viacom. Eventually, they raised money at a $6 billion valuation. Today, they're nothing. But they still make $600 million a year in revenue. And so I want to talk about some of the crazy stuff that the founder did, as well as how their business model works. And so have you ever heard of the, the guy, Shane Smith, who was the CEO and kind of the main man? Never. All right. So he had a whole bunch of interesting things that he did. So if you Google Shane Smith, you'll probably see like pictures of him. Like it's a it's a a guy who almost looks like a punk rock Santa Claus, where he's kind of <laughs> like a bigger guy, and he like you'll see like he's got sleeve tattoos, and you'll see him shirtless all the time and smoking a cigar. Do you like see any pictures like yeah, that? Yeah, he looks like um he looks a little bit like the guy who's the number two guy in Billions. I forgot what the guy's name is. Uh, like not not axe. But his his right hand man, yeah, he looks yeah, yeah. a lot like that guy. If that guy had just like chest tattoos, if he just had like a tattoo around his nipple, this, this that'd be this guy, dude. So he's just like crazy. And so Vice originally, the way that they became respected is they would do all this crazy stuff. But it was him doing it, Shane, the CEO. And so he would go to Liberia during uh, when they're having a civil war, and he would just bring a camera and just get dropped in Liberia and figure it out. In 2013, he traveled to North Korea <laughs> because he organized a basketball game between the Harlem Glo Globetrotters <laughs> and the national team of North Korea. <laughs> and that was like the big shtick. And then eventually, do you remember hearing about Dennis Rodman going yeah. to uh, North Korea? That was for a Vice documentary. Uh... And they would make these like free documentaries and they would post them on uh, it was originally their site and then they moved to YouTube and they would get lots of views and they would like put like an Intel logo on there and that's how they made money and so they and so he was known for walking around his office of like vice and I've been to the office it's like as magnificent as you'd think it's like the coolest of the cool and he would walk around shirtless and he would just like say crazy stuff he was known for just being like this wild guy and so one time when he hired a CEO 
her name was Nancy. This was recently. He said, "We're the modern, we're the modern day Body and Clyde, and we're here to take all your money." <laughs> and he would just say stuff like that all the time. There was another time when they were just getting started, and uh, I believe it was into it. They came, um, was it into it or IBM? One of those. They came to the office in order to uh, pitch, or Vice was going to pitch into it. And so what they did was there was a really shitty office at the time. Twenty four hours before the meeting, he built like a glass. Uh, conference room so it looked legit <laughs> and so you could see your employees and then he went and hired a bunch of like actors and got a tons of friends to come and work in the office <laughs> to make it look like they're important because he always like said something like um we don't want them to think that we're or what do you say we want them to think that we're rich like they like he was like we're gonna act as if right. and he did and they eventually got a 25 million dollar deal from this company and it worked out and there was another time where <laughs> There was this, uh, in 2003, Vice made it, their documentary on themselves. And he tells a story about when they started the company, how he got ar arrested in Bangkok. Uh, Bangkok, And he said something like, a few years later, they were like, yeah, remember that story you talked about being imprisoned in Bangkok? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I remember that. And he goes, tell me more about that. He goes, well... I made it all up. We needed a story <laughs> on how the we needed a story on how the company started, and I'd heard the story from someone else, so I just took it over. And we needed, and I just had to take make it mine. He's like, I watched so The Hangover do, Three and uh, <laughs> decided that was my life. Dude, he would do crazy stuff like that all the time. There was another time where I was reading this interview with him. He uh, there was this headline about how he spent three hundred thousand dollars at dinner in Vegas. And a reporter goes, did you really spend $300,000 for dinner? He goes, no. It was $380,000 plus tip. And it was barely dinner. It was mostly wine. <laughs> uh, and so <laughs> he's just, he, the guy's like wild. He even tells uh, crazier stories where he goes, this was a quote from uh, the uh, Financial Times. He would go, I would be at the party and would just go get wasted, take Coke, have sex with girls in the bathroom. And then get, uh, and then afterwards, mail my advertisers drugs because I knew if I sent them a bunch of drugs in the mail, they would keep buying ads with us. And he admits all what? this stuff. He's, it's crazy, man. This How could this wild. have gone bankrupt? I just don't get it. <laughs> well, so check this Where out. Where did we go wrong? Was it when we mailed our customers drugs, or when I did drugs during, during the day when I was working with my shirt off, having sex in the bathrooms? <laughs> Dude, he tells a story about him and his co-founders having threesomes with like people who are going to buy ads with them. <laughs> and he says that they were like mobsters who accidentally clanked shovels together while they were burying a body. <laughs> if, that, if that analogy makes sense. When someone was like, what's it feel like having, a, having sex with your co-founder? And, you know, do you guys ever like touch? He goes, yeah, but it's just like two mafia guys and our <laughs> shovels accidentally clank while we're burying the body. <laughs> <laughs> wow <laughs> this guy is a showman he's a total showman of course <clears throat> it didn't work out well <laughs> but, a, um, in all seriousness didn't uh totally blew it <laughs> <laughs> it didn't it didn't work out well for the company but it worked out for him so google shane smith house yeah i see a 50 million dollar house I, i'm up two steps ahead he already googled it so this there's this amazing article that came out in 2008 where it's all about Shane Smith and it says Shane Smith's living large and it documents his new house that he purchased for 30 million dollars I think and it's this beautiful mansion up in uh, LA somewhere well he recently sold it for 50 million dollars so like this guy has totally come out on top of this of this whole thing and I, it's just really fascinating that he basically came in he spent about 15 20 years doing his thing Right before, like tide, the tide change, and like these guys were the opposite of woke. Now Vice is like the wokest of the woke. But right before that change happened, he got his money, he got out, and he bounced, and he hired a CEO. And uh, his story is super, super fascinating. And so you've never heard of him? I've never heard of him. Uh, I briefly knew that Vice started as a as a zine or a magazine. What's your main takeaways? Because this is entertaining. Because this guy's like Felix Dennis, just like reincarnated. Um, so what's your takeaway? You're a media guy. You're, you're a bit of a wild man. W what's your take on this? Not that yeah, wild. Not, I mean, this, this guy yeah. makes you look like a, like a, you know, choir boy or something, but, uh, w what's your takeaways from this story? I have a bunch of takeaways. And so, but first let me tell you how their business model works because that's part of my takeaways. So a lot of people don't realize how they make money. They're going bankrupt now, but they still make 600 million a year in revenue, but it's just like wildly unprofitable. So they, th their company, it's basically like, I consider it like a mortgage-backed security 
for media. And so do you remember like the mortgage backed securities of 2008, where it was basically like banks would buy like tens of thousands of mortgages in one tranche? Turns out like 4,000 of the 10,000 were yeah. shit. That's exactly what Vice does. <laughs> and so they, they got famous because they only had like 20 or 30 million monthly visits to their website, vice.com, which isn't a ton. That's not a ton for hundreds of millions in revenue. What they did was they did uh, they partnered with omgfacts.com, distractify.com, and all these other clickbait websites. And they would roll that up. And so they would sit, call them part of the Vice network. And so they would tell people, uh, you know, like Intel or whoever the big advertisers are, look, re- we reach all of... Uh, millennials, and we have 100 million, 200 million monthly uniques to our network. In reality, it was on like shit sites, right. like, you know, all those other things. And that was like, once that came out, it was kind of frowned upon. And then the other way they made money was they had an agency called Virtue, like Vice and Virtue, which is pretty clever. But their whole company is basically a creative agency. So they would make content for Snapchat, Facebook, and then eventually HBO, and all, and they would get paid like a service fee, basically, for it. And it was basically one big agency, and that's how they made money. Which brings me to the takeaways. Takeaway one, if you're going to be a company that makes money from multiple different streams of revenue, you got to nail one first. They didn't even nail one like stream of revenue. They had like five other things that added up to a lot, but not one of them worked wonderfully, at least not enough to be profitable. So that's one major takeaway. The second major takeaway is they would always say they're going to be the next Disney. They go, we're going to be a mini Disney. Shane once said, we're worth 10 billion right now. But conservatively, I think we're going to be worth 40 or 50 billion in a couple of years. That couple of years would have been like in 2020 or something. Never worked out. Because we're going to be just like Disney, except with like cocaine. Didn't work out. Why? Because no one likes them. If you're going to build the next Disney, you got to be like, people got to love you. You know, people love Mickey Mouse. They don't really <laughs> love like Shane Smith, you know, and all that stuff. You know, they like them. They don't, they don't really love them. So if you're going to be a media company like that, you have to have something that people love. The next thing is news. If you're going to be in the news business, that's really, really hard because you have to stay relevant. And I actually think that you should be something that typically people don't grow out of, but they grow into. Meaning a Wall Street Journal, a New York Times, if you're going to be like one of these publications, Economist, Financial Times, things like that. You want to grow into it. Meaning like as you get older, you want to like aspire to be able to read it and like it and understand it and brag about it. Whereas with Vice, it was like, I'm no longer 28 years right. old. Reading about this stuff is not exactly cool. And plus, the people working there you kind of look silly. I've always said about this about bar, Barstool Sports. I'm like, dude, Dave Portnoy is getting older. Like some of these antics are kind of not going to be cool anymore. They're more so like pathetic. Do you know what I mean? And that's kind of happened with Vice. Yeah, you basically, uh, you either stay with the shtick and you just start to look like a clown as you get older and older or you got to sell, get out and change your life, you know, change your lifestyle. And uh, it's pretty interesting because it's very hard to let go because A, if you weren't such a nut, you wouldn't have got that got this level of success in the first place. So it's kind of like a self fulfilling prophecy. And then on the second second uh, part of it, you know, it's very easy to get addicted to the character, the, the the fame, the money that comes with with acting a certain way. You're being rewarded, rewarded, rewarded. And then you, now you're 57, and you're you know, or you know you're you're Vince McMahon now, or you're Hugh Hefner now, or you're whoever. Right? Like it's hard to leave the character. Uh, even though you might actually, sh- you, maybe you actually should, uh, you know, grow out of it. Um, anyways, but I- I'm the, glad that these guys don't the, grow out of it. It's it's for our entertainment. Thank you, thank you for your service, Shane Smith. It is. And the last two things: if you're going to build a media company, avoid New York City. <laughs> like when you're a creative services business, you need it's a it's a talent arbitrage and it's really hard to do that when you're in a re- really high cost of living city like New York. And also you saw that they like became this woke company which I don't entirely believe like go woke go broke like that type of thing. I do think that um I think that like there's a niche you can make money in any niche it doesn't matter if you're woke or not. But they like changed that way when that wasn't originally what they did. And I think they changed that way because they moved to like Williamsburg and, and everything like that. And it totally changed their uh, their their shtick. But the last thing is actually a compliment. 
So you texted me the other day, right before you're about to go on to, you were going to speak at this conference and you said, uh, what did you say? About to drop some showmanship on these bitches. Is that what you <laughs> yeah, said? About to show these bitches some showmanship. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that is totally true. And that is what he did. And frankly, even though he, it seems as though he conned a lot of people, he kind of got the last laugh <laughs> and he had showmanship throughout the entire thing. And had it worked out, it would have been a lot cooler. But having showmanship, it totally works. By the way, there's like stories. People ask me, like, oh, do you get nervous before public speaking? It's like, ah, I don't know, man. If I was nervous, I probably wouldn't be thinking I'm about to drop some showmanship on these bitches. <laughs> it's a different attitude. Exactly. Versus, I hope I don't mess Exa- up. <laughs> Dude, he, te- he, like, throughout his career, if you can, like, there's so many crazy stories about this guy. It's all about showmanship. He does the wildest stuff where he, like, tells stories. The, the way he tells stories, it captures your attention. And some of his employees were like, when I'm with Shane, I feel like I'm going to war and I'll go to any war with him. Right. Or there's like uh, Johnny Knoxville did an interview and he was talking about Shane and he goes, he's the greatest uh, leader you could ever have. Also uh, the greatest drinking buddy. But, uh, and, and like, he like does this. What a bio. Yeah. He like has all of these like amazing one liners, even if they are full of shit. But whenever I hear him talk, I'm like, oh my God, I b- believe everything you said. So, for example, have you ever heard me say, the best way to circumvent someone's bullshit detector is to not bullshit. Yeah. I've used that line a couple of times. I stole it from him. So he would like, he has all these like amazing one liners and that showmanship. It's absolutely captivating. There's like a story about him with Rupert Murdoch and Rupert Murdoch and Shane are walking. And Rupert Murdoch is like a, you know, if you see the movie uh, TV show Succession, he's like that yeah. guy. He's like a mean old man. And Shane sits down with them and goes, You don't have millennials but I do. I have everything you don't have. And like, he's talking to this billionaire. Is it testosterone? Like or is it, what, <laughs> the, yeah. the value of my yeah. youth? <laughs> what, 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 what are the things I don't have? All right. But he just like totally like swings above his weight. And I think it's really fascinating to learn from this guy. So if you're listening to this, Google Shane Smith. It's There's like crazy stories about this guy. Good segment by you. Good good job by you. Good job. I like that one. Uh, I actually have a, a spinoff of that. You mentioned a company in there. And I was like, hmm, that sounds familiar. I kind of remember this name. So you said OMG Facts. Do you know who started OMG Facts? I do. I forget his name, but he's an oddball, right? This guy, Emerson Sparts. And I met Emerson yeah. Sparts maybe 10 years ago. And, so, and when he was building OMG Facts and building uh, a network called Dose Media. He's like a genius, he's right? A, he's, like a he, he is. I met him and I was like, wow, this guy is super smart. Um, I actually think that he is kind of like if he had just applied himself to some other areas, he would have like totally uh, done done some uh, like you know absolutely amazing things. Everybody would know his name versus just kind of me and half of you knowing his name. So I'm going to tell you a couple things about Emerson Sparts. So the guy, when he was 12 years old, built a website called MuggleNet. And I don't know if you're a Harry Potter guy, but I'm I'm a Harry Potter guy. And I was on MuggleNet all the time. And I used to love this because it was the number one Harry Potter fan site in the world. Tons and tons of traffic. I mean, at the time, Harry Potter was like, you know, Justin Bieber. It was, Harry Potter was, was super, super famous. And in between the books, people wanted a place to discuss, to post theories, to post fan fiction, to uh, debate, you know, what should have happened, blah, blah, blah. And so MuggleNet, when he's 12... He builds the super popular site, getting millions and millions of visitors. When he's 18, he publishes a best-selling book. His best-selling book is called, uh, I think it's called Harry Potter Should Have Died. Controversial oh, Views from the Number One Fan Site. And basically, it's like, Harry survived, but should he have? Uh, you know, I run the world's biggest fan site for Harry Potter. And here's some of the controversial viewpoints that people have about Harry Potter. You can already see this guy's got the, he's got the certain, that au jus that comes with the sandwich. You know, <laughs> that he, he's got the sauce and uh, he's got the showmanship. And so he, I, I, I met him, maybe he was, I don't know how old he was, maybe 22 or something like this at this point. And um, where'd you meet him? I don't even remember, man. I, just, I remember being on a call with him, a video call. And it was him and I think his girlfriend at the time. And they were creating something called Dose Media. And I go, so what is it? He goes, well, we were going to make like really viral content. So uh, they had OMG Facts. That was one of their companies. They had like four or five websites like that. One that was like science facts. One that was funny things. One that was 
whatever, controversial or pop culture stuff, like references to TV shows and things that were hot right now. And they had these websites and I go, okay, so how do you like, at the time in my mind, I was like, going viral is getting, you know, lightning strikes you, you know, you, it's just not something you try to do. It's just something that happens or it doesn't happen. And it usually doesn't happen. He's like, no, no, no. And he had built a four part system. And this is the first guy. He's like, yeah, we're a different type of technology company. We have uh, 18 engineers and we have four writers and we reach millions and millions oh, of people no. a month. And I was like, no, no, it was actually good. I was like, so what do, what do the engineers do? He's like, well, basically all the viral content on the, in the world starts either in one of three places, Reddit, Imager, or 4chan. And he's like, basically I built a detector that would find stuff that's going, that's getting hot on those, on those three platforms First, before it hits Instagram, before it hits Facebook, before it hits Twitter, uh, it's going to get popular there first. And he goes, so we built a detector. Then we built a, um, like a, then the writer basically would, would uh, build like, like write a summary. And then we built a, a A-B tester that would basically create headlines, um, headlines and, uh, and, and like different like uh, frames of that same story and it would test them really quickly. Then we had a tester that would spray that out. We would pay to get that in front of like, you know, 5,000, 10,000 people. We would find what, what's the winning angle. And then we would have the post and then distribution, right? And then we would actually distribute that to our audience. And so we could engineer a higher degree of virality in every piece of content. Why? Because we're finding the best stuff. We're packaging it quickly with our writer. Then we're remixing it with our automated A-B tester that's going to juice up the headlines and then the images. Then we're t uh, spraying it out, getting data feedback, telling us which of these 15 variations is the winner, and then we post the winner. And um, I was like, dude, this is amazing. And over the few years, I saw him build this up, and he his traffic kept going up and up. Now, the problem was his traffic wasn't that valuable. It was kind of fly-by traffic. Uh, it was kind of like the lowest common denominator of the internet. And from Facebook, I think. It was right? very dependent on social networks. And then Facebook changed. And for a while, Facebook was like rewarding the hell out of anybody that could post viral content. And then it got too clickbaity on Facebook. And then Facebook just manually went and unplugged the like viral engines for, for, for these companies. And so like 10 companies died, like, you know, uh, in the, in that transition, I don't think his totally died, but I think it, it definitely slowed down. And I think he also grew up and was sort of like, what else do I want to do with my life? So now I just went to, by the way, really quick before that, before you go on to him, did I, have I told you about my partner at Hampton, Joe, he had a company called little things, which was the same thing as that. It was a content yep. like clickbait website. He started it in New York. And then uh, like he had all these, he had multiple floors in an office building and it was killing it. They were at a hundred million in revenue. He had a deal to sell. They went through due diligence. The deal was going to close in two weeks. That change that you just referred to, it happened to Little Things. At the time, Little Things was the most trafficked website from Facebook in the world. So it was like Little Things, and then it was like HuffPo, and then like right. BuzzFeed. BuzzFeed, yeah. The deal was about to close, I think, for a hundred and something million. He was going to walk away with 50 million after taxes. Two weeks before the money was supposed to go through, that change happened. The deal, he lost the deal and weeks or months, like only a couple months later, they had to shut down the company. And it was Ugh. all because they built everything on top of Facebook. That's a Mike Tyson gut punch, right? Like uh, uh, birds fly, fish swim, and deals fall through. That is the, 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 the sad part about <laughs> deals. The, the, that is too common. Yes, and that's very common. That's what happened to this guy, Emmett Smart. Em Emmett Sparks. So what happened to him afterwards? Name's Emerson Sparks. <laughs> Emerson Sparks. Emmett Smart. Sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, here's his bio now. Um, he's, his thing says like AI, history, complex systems of Bitcoin. Then he goes, goal. I want to die number one on the leaderboard of people who change the world. And so his what he's doing now is something Bold. called nonlinear. And nonlinear, it looks like, is basically a... Is basically a uh, a company that is funding people working on AI to make it make sure that it's safe, and so um, so they f they fund basically nonlinear entrepreneurs, people who are trying to work on these like exponential technologies, and so yeah, they we incubate x x risk x risk nonprofits. I don't even know what x risk nonprofits means uh, by connecting founders with ideas, funding, and mentorship, and so that's what he's working on now. But this guy's always going to do interesting things. This guy can't. This guy can't be uninteresting, dude. I, when I read about him, I I was like, 
why are you doing this, dude? Like, you're doing this dose media thing. Like, you seem like a genius. You're just absolutely wasting it. This is a, what do you say? It's a uh, high uh, high effort, low, or what do you say? It's like Hormozy had a good one for this. It's, like, it's a 10 out of 10, um, 10 out of 10 entrepreneur going at a 4 out of 10 opportunity. And uh, that's how I felt when I met him. I remember literally, like, this is now 10 plus years later. I have not spoke to this guy. You mentioned OMG Facts, and in my mind, I'm like, that guy's smart. Follow up with that guy, right? Because he left such an impression on me where I was like, this guy is really, really clever, really smart, really also like wholesome. Like even at the time, he was like, uh, even though he was working on something that's like typically, I would say almost everybody I know that's in this kind of like viral media, actually just like lame. There's kind of shitheads. And um, (laughs) and I mean that like in an endearing way, like, you know, some people are shitheads and it's all right. You're just like, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm, I found this arbitrage. I'm making it happen. Um, and so he was not that. He was really soft-spoken, really, really nice guy. Ben says, X risk is the risk that something could end the world. It's an existential risk. Okay, yeah, good. So he's he's going to save the planet, which is good. Dude, and his website is a is a .org. Yeah, noble he's a, mission. He's a .org type of guy. I had a, w- yeah. I, when I was in Austin, um, a friend of mine was hanging out with Justin Mares, who's been on the pod before. I think I can quote this because I think it's a, good quote but he said uh he goes justin said the best thing he goes it doesn't matter how you make your first nut you just got to make your first nut but after you do that then you want to work on a noble mission and he's like dude I, he's like i like that he's like you know do whatever you got to do to make to make your first nut which is you, to, you know get your the first few million dollars where you're financially free and you're and you're uh you don't have to have a job you can work on whatever the hell you want but then after that don't go chase the second nut Go go after something that's a noble mission. Go after something that's awesome, and um, yeah, very few people actually do that. In fact, I don't even think Justin is doing that at the moment. But but I I love the quote. Isn't he doing like an FSA spending store? That's like the most like opportunistic thing I could hear. I think of the way that he pitched it. It was pretty awesome. He said something like, uh, "Obesity in America is like an epidemic, and sixty percent of people are overweight." We want to make you eat healthier by making it easier to acquire like, you know, this types of food and this type of healthcare, And we're doing it via. And then he like, that's where the pitch comes in. All right, it, so that's always a good let's pitch. Go look. So his site. I think it's True called Med. True Medicine. True Med. So True Med. He says food is medicine, exercise is medicine, sleep is medicine. We don't mean this in a theoretical sense. Food, exercise, and sleep are all scientifically proven to prevent or alleviate uh, physical and mental illness. In short, these are all medicine. It's a true med is a payment integration that enables qualified customers to use pre-tax HSA and FSA funds to purchase health promoting products and services from their favorite merchants. Soon it'll be av- available in the checkout flow for all merchants who are for merchants who sell healthy food, supplements, exercise equipment, and other health and wellness products. This is such a good idea, by the way. This is a phenomenal idea. This is a 10 out of 10 opportunity. And uh, dude, he pitched dude, me to why, invest. Why have I not invested in this? Let me invest in this I didn't right invest because I was just like saying no to everything. And yeah. I deeply regret it. I deeply regret it. Because by the way, this is the best way to pitch a business, which is like, you like paint this like dreary picture of like, the world is obese. You know, did you know that like, if you add up all the terrorist attacks, all the guns, all the car right. accidents, it would only be one tenth of the people who die, uh, you know, from being obese, like, you know, that type of fact. And you say, like, if we continue this, this is what the outcome is going to be, this and that. And and so we need to solve this the way that we are happen to happen to be trying to solve this is by doing X, Y and Z. And I'm like, all right, that's a great pitch. Yeah, this is a uh, wow. I am so jealous that I'm not invested in this. I'm, I'm, I'm messaging him right now. All right. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's it. That's the pod. We're out of here.